Welcome to Brain in a Vat. Uh, today we have Eliza Gelgut, who teaches at the University of Cape Town, and she specializes in the philosophy of art. Um, Eliza, would you like to start with a thought experiment? You, you go into an art museum, um, and in front of you are five red squares. And um, four of them are, happen to be works of art, and one of them is just an ordinary piece of cardboard that's painted red. Um, and the one red square's got the, the title, um, the, uh, the Red Sea after the crossing of the Israelites. Uh, the other one is called Kierkegaard's Mood. The other one is called simply Red Square. Uh, the other one is called Untitled. And the last one is not a work of art at all, it's just a red square. But it's visually indistinguishable from all the other works of art, which are all visually indistinguishable from one another. Um, but Danto says the way we interpret them would be very different. So for example, um, if we looked at the red square that said, um, this is the Red Sea after the crossing of the Israelites, we would imagine a kind of weird kind of calm because it's the Red Sea's parted and Israelites have passed through and the Egyptians have all been drowned. So there it's a kind of eerie calm, for example. Or is the, the red square that said, um, you know, Kierkegaard's mood would be what kind of mood is going to be exemplified by the color red. Uh, a red square that was just untitled, we might then think had different kinds of aesthetic features. And so the question that Danto raises about the nature of art is essentially that there are certain things that art has perceptually, right? We can pick them out perceptually, but that doesn't seem to quite capture the essence of art because also the red square that is not a work of art, that is just a red square, and that's visually completely in indistinguishable from a work of art that is a red square, doesn't have any aesthetic properties at all, right? It's just, it's just a red square. So in virtue of what does one thing have aesthetic properties? And in fact, we've got two different things that look the same, but it might have very different aesthetic properties. The, the work of art that says, you know, this is the Red Sea after the crossing of the Israelites has got different aesthetic properties from the work of art that says perhaps Kierkegaard's mood or Red Square. And yet this seems to be a puzzle. It seems to be a puzzle, A, about the nature of art. What is, what is um, essentially the difference between art and ordinary things? And in virtue of what do ordinary things get their aesthetic properties? Um, so this is what the thought experiment is, is trying to highlight. Danto actually wants to say that this is not really different in principle for many other different kinds of philosophical problems. He thinks that, um, the kind of appearance reality distinction, if you like, crops up in many other philosophical is issues. So for example, in the philosophy of mind, um, we might want to say, look, they're two creatures who from the outside look absolutely identical. Um, and they both engage in sets of, of, of actions, or of activities. But if the one creature has a mind, then we want to say its actions are intentional. It has actions, it acts. Whereas if the other creature does not have a mind, we don't want to say that it acts. We want to say maybe that it exhibits behavior, but it doesn't act. There's no intentional action. But from the outside, we might not be able to tell the difference. So what's the difference between an action and an activity, for example? Uh, the same might be true of ethics. Two people could engage in exactly the same behavior, which from the outside looks the same, one person could be engaging in an ethical act and the other person might not be engaging in an ethical act. So Danzo actually thinks that this is quite a common problem in philosophy, that the perceptual data are not sufficient uh, to tell us very often what the nature of something is. But he thinks this is a particular problem in art, especially in modern art. He thinks this problem didn't really arise sort of before maybe, you know, the 20th century and with the rise of kind of pop art and Andy Warhol and, and um, uh, a lot of perhaps also found art, Duchamp's um, snow shovel, for example, looks just like any other snow shovel. In fact, it was just like any other snow shovel before Duchamp put it in a, uh, in a museum and gave it a label uh, in advance of a broken arm. 
So Dante then asks this question, which then prompts him to come up with a theory of art. But I think that philosophers for centuries have been interested in, in the nature of art. What is art? Is art something good? Is it bad? Why do we care about art? Um, you know, it has no functional value. Or if it does, it's not valuable in virtue of the fact that it has functional value. Um, so that's ultimately what the, the thought experiment is trying to highlight. So it's a great thought experiment because it kind of, the idea is that perceptual, as you say, perceptual features of an artwork are not sufficient to generate the fact that A, it is art and B, what type of art it is and what it means. Um, so, you know, it's an invitation. This thought experiment is an invitation to, to ask us, well, what could it be? And just off the top of my head, I can think of a whole bunch of different options. Um, but I'm going to ask you what, 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 uh, what Danto's account is and what, what the various ways are that we could try and cash this out. But just before I do that, I want to suggest a, a kind of more skeptical approach um, because mm. I'm a skeptic about aesthetic properties. Um, so, so the skeptical approach would be, well, maybe, maybe there's one of two things we can glean from this. One is maybe there is no such thing as art. In other words, just the normal square, just the red square that isn't intended to be art. Well, if that's just the same as the other red squares, well, then we should think the other red squares are just not art. Okay, so that's one way of dealing with it. It would be a skeptical approach. Another one would be maybe it's just the titles are different. So because the titles of each of the four squares are different, it's not actually correct that the art is the same in each case because the title is a part of the art. So let's, I mean, let's first look at the question, is there such a thing as art? Um, well, there clearly is because we have an art world. We have discussions about the nature of art. Now, you might want to say, well, um, we're just sort of fooling ourselves that there isn't anything really that we're kind of talking about. Um, I think just from a kind of, if you like, not even, not even really a pragmatic point of view, but I, I think that extreme, extreme skeptical view is, would really be sort of looking back on the past several thousand years of human history and saying everybody was simply mistaken about uh, what we're doing when we look at um, great paintings, when we listen to great poetry, um, when we go to the theater, you know, it would, it would really reduce a huge and important section of our experience as being human. Um, it would really kind of bring that into question. What on earth are we doing? Um, and you might say, well, of course, yes, so be it. That's what the skeptic is, is, is supposed to do. Um, but I think part of, you know, Richard Volheim has this, has this idea that he says, look, we can use the word art in two ways. It, we can use it descriptively. And you want to say these things are works of art and these things are not. But he also thinks that the work of art has a normative function. It's evaluative. So when we say something is a work of art, we're saying something important about it. We're not simply saying it belongs to that category, but we're saying it has a certain value. And it's in virtue of that value that we think it, it's important. And I, I tend to agree with that. And, and I think also, and I think Valheim also makes this point, is that any definition we have of art should tell us what's valuable about art. It shouldn't simply be a kind of a description that can, um, a descriptive definition that can say these things are works of art while these things are not, but it sh should also tell us something about why, why we value art and what's valuable um, about the nature of art. So, um, yeah, I think I would disagree with you, your extreme, extreme skeptical view. So what was the other point oh, to say, is, is the title not part of the, of the work of art? Um, not always, of course, because sometimes works of art just don't have titles. Sometimes we give them titles um, after the fact. I guess the question is, what is the title doing? Um, I mean, you could also have a work of art that's just untitled, and um, we still we don't want to say that doesn't make it a work of art. I mean, it's an interesting thing. You know, why does somebody say the work of art is untitled? I think a title is in part an invitation to interpretation. So you you know, if you if you entitle your work. Um, the Red Sea after the uh, drowning of the Egyptians or something. I think it invites the viewer to look at the, at the painting in a particular way. And it's partly this looking that um, is part of what interpretation is about, I think. 
Well, I, I think we've, we've got to assume for the moment that art exists, right? So let's just assume mm. it. At the end, I'm, gonna, I'm still going to punch back on it. But just for now, okay. let's assume that art exists. So, so what is Danto's solution? Okay, so he's saying that these four pieces are qualitatively identical. And let's just assume that the name is not part of the art. The title is not part of the art. So they are qualitatively identical. I was just, I was just denying that. I was saying the thought experiment fails. But let's just assume the thought experiment goes through. Um, right. What is it that makes them pieces of art A and B? What is it that makes them different from each other? Danto is sometimes thought of as having a purely what we call institutional theory of art. Um, but I don't think that's, that's the case. So a purely institutional theory of art would be uh, a theory that simply says uh, a work of art is whatever the art institution of the day decides is a work of art. Uh, so if, you, if the art director puts something up in a museum, that's a work of art. Uh, and if the critics decide, then, then that's a work of art, right? Uh, it sometimes sounds like Hume has an institutional theory of art because Hume said that um, the great critics decide on what on what great works about are, and the rest of us kind of kind of go along with that. Um, in fact, that's a very very brief account of Hume, and I'm I'm not doing him him justice either. But so Danto does appeal to the art institutions, and he he thinks that we cannot have art without at the same time having an institution of art, because art is um, it's a it's a social it's a social construct, right? Um, but he thinks that we need other things as well, because simply saying that art is whatever the institution decides is art is not particularly helpful. Certainly it's not helpful if we want to understand what's important or interesting about art, because you can say, well, okay, the institution could take anything and make it a work of art. And so what, you know, then why on earth should we care about what art is? So Danto also, he kind of compares art to metaphor. He says an artwork has a subject. It's about something. Um, so let's just take um, and well, let's just take the particular example that that we're looking at. Say the um, the drowning of the Egyptians um, after the the, um, the passing of the Israelites through the Red Sea. So we say, well, that's the the subject matter of the work of art. But the the a work of art doesn't simply present the subject matter. It also has what he calls a point of view about the subject matter. Uh, is it glorifying the drowning of the Egyptians? Is it um, weeping for the drowning of the Egyptians, right? The work of art has a point of view about its particular subject matter. And it expresses that point of view metaphorically. It's, it's not simply, you know, you could, if you went in home and wrote a philosophy essay, for example, about the drowning of the Egyptians. That would be a kind of literal analysis. A work of art doesn't work that way. It works in a metaphorical way that requires interpretation, Danto says. So essentially that's his definition of art. It's kind of metaphorical. It, it, a work of art wants to say something, uh, have a particular point of view about its subject matter that it conveys to an audience in a way that requires the audience to make an interpretation of what that particular work of art is about. So Danto's account of art is, is intentionalist, right? He thinks that uh, somebody has to, in, is, is, intends to say something via a work of art. And um, it needn't be anything particularly profound, but he thinks if we're giving a pure definitional account of a work of art, that's, that's what makes something a work of art. And it distinguishes works of art from ordinary things because works uh, ordinary things don't require interpretation so red square is just a red square right if you want to paint your house uh, or, or put up you know paint something red for example um you just want it maybe to look pretty but it doesn't have a subject matter it's not saying something uh it doesn't require interpretation so Danto thinks all those things are part of what makes something um a work of art so there's an interesting sort of movement in AI to be able to have AI generate things. So there's a website called This Is Not A Face, and it generates um, images of people that don't exist. And uh, they're, they're indistinguishable from, from, from photographs of, of, of real people. 
Um, and there's a, a version which is, this is not a work of art. Um, so what it does is it goes and looks through um, famous works of abstract art, and then it goes and generates its own. Now, there is no intentional agent um, making those individual works of art. You might think that there was a coder who sort of taught the machine how to do this, um, and it's positing, it's producing um, objects that look art-like, that have aesthetic properties, they might be uh, beautiful, they might be the kind of things that someone might try and decipher a meaning out of as well, or, or have an emotional experience of, in the same way that they would some other work of art. Um, but do these things count? I don't think Dato would say they do. Um, because of course human beings engage in all sorts of interpretive activity, but uh, it doesn't mean that all the things we make interpret interpretations about are going to be um, are going to be works of art. Um, forgeries are not are not artworks for the same reason because they're simply copies. Mm. Uh, and I think he thinks one of the things the virtues of his account is that it can tell us why forgeries are not works of art. Is of course forgeries, especially if they're very good forgeries, can be sort of indistinguishable from the um, original original artwork. Um, so no, I mean, I'm actually much more a fan of, of Richard Volheim's because he, Volheim has an expressionist account of art. And I think he would agree with a lot of what Danto is saying, but for Volheim works of art, essentially, um, and this is the reason he thinks that they're important, they've expressed something very deep about the human condition. And the greater the work of art, the more it expresses, the more expressive it is. Um, so it's not simply that a work of art has a kind of point of view, but uh, Valheim thinks that it expresses something very deep and important um, about, about the human condition. Because one of the worries about Danto's account is that it makes even ordinary metaphor, for example, a work of art. Because an ordinary metaphor, you know, my, well, I suppose my love is like a red, red rose <laughs> is from a poem, right? But in the ordinary course of things, we use metaphor all the time. And you might say, well, metaphor has a point of view, it has a subject matter, um, it requires interpretation. Could a metaphor not be a work of art? Um, and that, you know, so there's a worry that the theory is a little bit, is a little bit too, too broad. Um, whereas if you add in another requirement that it's not simply that a work of art has a point of view about its subject matter, but that it's it tries to express something, and now this, is, this gets a bit vague, but um, it expresses something deeply emotional um, that the artist is trying to convey in a way that he or she could not convey any other way, then I think um, it becomes a, a richer account. So if we kind of add maybe an expressive element to Danto's account, I think we have a much, a much richer account of not only what is art, but why is art important. So I'm interested in the second question of what, what makes mm. art valuable um, in the sense of, of important, not necessarily in terms of price. Um, yeah. And it seems like part of what's going to matter to my mind would be, you know, the amount of uh, technique that's used. So there are certain kinds of works of art where we recognize that it's painstaking to make it, uh, that it requires an enormous amount of labor and maybe also, um, a technical expertise, not just that it's doing the same repetitive activity over and over, but that it, mm. it requires uh, years um, of, of mastering this this technique in order to produce the thing. Um, and so you can imagine, let's say, the hyper-realist painter, you know, who, who studies for years to perfectly reproduce um, a portrait of someone. And then let's say we compare that to um, someone doing the same thing with an HDR camera. Um, and so there's the one click versus the years of sort of uh, of detail, but they might express mm. the same thing. In other words, they might both, they might be also largely indistinguishable from each other. We might have the same subject and the same conditions. Um, but it seems that uh, the one seems more impressive than the other. Mm. Um, so again, I think it's, um, you need to cash this out partly by trying to understand what you mean by expression. So, so Volheim, for example, who has an expressive account of art. He thinks that there is something important in um, the skill, the way the painter sits in front of the canvas, the skill of um, the hand, the use of paint, all those sorts of things that he thinks is part of the making of the artwork. And so the, 
and that's part of the express the the the, the um, expressive activity, right? Is is actually the, the kind of hard work that that goes into it. So I think Dante would want to say it's impossible to have the same ex expression in the artwork if it's somebody who um, paints a painting that takes him, you know, three months, and somebody who just takes a photograph of something, because the work is part of the um, of the expression. If we if we accept that that art is this unique place and that it is valuable, mm. um, how resistant should it be to to censorship? So there are going to be people throughout history have said, "I don't like this work of art. Uh, it offends me. You know, it uh, it portrays my God in a negative light. Uh, it's sexist. It's racist. Um, wh whatever other epithet you'd like to to throw at it." And because of that, I want it um, banned um, or burnt. Um, so is it a balancing act? Do we say, well, we sort of weigh up the value of the art and we try and preserve the very good ones? Um, and, you know, we sort of take the emotions on the other hand, or do we say, uh, no, our art has a very strong right to exist and that any move to, to destroy it uh, must be resisted at all costs? Well, if, you, if you're asking me from, from, my, from my point of view, uh, I think I'm going to definitely lean towards the latter point. I mean, I'm very, very much against um, censorship and um, and pretty much, you know, any kind of um, censoring of, of freedom of expression and, and freedom of thought. Um, so if we just sort of just take it as a general, the question about art as part of a larger question about free speech and freedom of expression, then I would certainly be very, um, very, very wary about censoring any kind of any kind of speech and certainly any kind of art. And I do think that art has um, has a, a, a kind of special a special privilege um, in terms of protections because I I do think that it's very easy to misinterpret works of art, for example. Um, and I do think that certainly great works of art. Um, have always got a lot more to say than even if they've got sexist elements to them um, or racist elements or whatever. Um, a great work of art is always going to say something much more interesting than, you know, than, than its element of racism or element of sexism or, or whatever. Um, and it would be a huge mistake to something to get rid of the arts. I mean, I'm just sort of, th the, th the, the work of art that comes to mind at the moment is, you know, let's say Milton's Paradise Lost, which is one of the greatest poems ever written in the English language. I do think that Milton was a bit of a sexist. I mean, it's been a while since I've read Paradise Lost, but you know, he's, he's fairly condescending and patronizing towards Eve. Um, is he a bit of a sexist? Probably. Is the work of art sexist? Maybe is, 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 a, better, is a better way of, of asking the question. Um, do I think that Paradise Lost should continue to be taught? Absolutely. Um, because it's incredibly rich and amazing poem, the likes of which we'll probably never see again. So I think um, also the sort of temptation to censor things that we don't like because they upset us. Look, I think also great art should upset us. I and mean, that's part of what it's meant to do is to unsettle us, um, make us feel uncomfortable. Um, you know, a lot of great art sets out to upset us and to make us uncomfortable. So I certainly don't think, I'm certainly not sympathetic whatsoever to, uh, to calls for censorship. I think, I think it's, it's very, very, um, just very, very dangerous apart from anything else. Um, and I also think it means that works of art that are great works of art that many of us want to see uh, will be hidden from view uh, in a way that I think is just, you know, completely un unacceptable. So, um, yeah, so I think I'm fairly, I feel quite strongly about, um, about not censoring works of art. I think we should do our utmost, you know, never to, never to do that if possible. So what's interesting to my mind is um, you, you mentioned the ambiguity in a work. So I was at UCT in 2002. Um, and one of the prized works of art um, in the library was a figure made by the artist Willy Bester of Saki Bartman. Now, Saki Bartman was a, a sand woman who was 
um, kidnapped and taken to Europe and paraded around. Um, and uh, Besta made this rather incredible work out of machine parts um, of her. And it was you know, really seen as this uh, important stance against uh, you know, the colonial endeavor and against racism um, and you know, was, was a cherished piece. Now, during the sort of Fees Must Fall movement at UCT in around 2015, 2016, um, students took a very different view of the artwork. Um, they saw it as a, um, a sort of an attack on the black body. They saw it as, as racist. Um, they made the assumption that Billy Bester was a white Afrikaans artist as opposed to a black artist living in a township. And they demanded that the, the piece be covered um, so that it was clothed in what looked like a burqa. Um, and, uh, and was hidden away for a long time. I think it took uh, an American librarian um, to sort of look at the piece and ask if that is how it was designed. And someone sheepishly said, well, no, it was, it was covered up. And uh, he then uh, cut off the cloth and uh, Saki Bartman was, was revealed in her original form. Um, and I, I gather that for some brief period of time, there was a discussion about the piece and it was again on display, um, but was then later hidden away. Um, so not destroyed, but uh, kept out of sight. Um, what, what is your take on that? That was a very, very sad period in UCT's history. I think that the artwork should not allow, should not, not have been allowed to have been covered up. Um, so first of all, I think that the university did a terrible disservice to Willy Bester uh, as an artist and to his uh, freedom of expression. Um, so from that point of view, I think it was... Um, well, quite quite shameful, actually, and I think it's a very shameful period in, in UCT's history. Um, I also think that, first of all, I think that the students totally misinterpreted what Willy Bester was doing, apart from anything else. Um, because what Willy Bester was trying to do, of course, was to comment on the fact that Saki Bartman was treated, you know, she was treated as, um, as a mere object. And in a sense, he tried to resurrect her by saying, I'm going to make her out of these sort of machine parts, out of these bits, which are kind of objects, but she's going to sort of arise anew. So it was, it was an attempt at reparation of, of, of kind of reclaiming her. Um, so his intention was completely different from what the students initially thought. But even if it weren't, I still think it would have been a shameful thing for UCT to have done. Plus, I think also what they did was, was they failed to understand that this was a work of art. I mean, in some of the rhetoric, they almost treated the work of art as, as if it was Saki Bartman herself. I mean, they clothed her up because they said they wanted to, you know, they didn't want to, her to be a kind of naked figure in the library, to be berated again as she had been in real life. And this just strikes me as crazy. I mean, it, it's a work of art. It's not a real person. Um, and I think there was this sort of conflation between the symbol and what it, and what it symbolized. And I think so part of what UCT did wrong, I think, was um, not educated students about how to look at art. So I think that there were many, many failures there and um, failures towards the artist himself, towards freedom of expression, uh, failures to educate the students about how they should think about art. Um, yeah, so I, I think that what the librarian, and who's, I think his name is, I think, we know who he is, so can I mention his name in the podcast? Because um, I think it's already out, out in the open. Uh, William Daniels, I think he had Im immense courage and I totally applaud, um, applaud what he did. So, uh, I, and I think uh, the, the wor works of art have still been censored at UCT. I mean, the Saki Bartman statue or sculpture has vanished. It's, it's been kept somewhere, we don't know where it is. Um, lots of works of art have, uh, have been removed. Probably they'll never see the light of day again. Um, and yeah, I think, it's, I think it's kind of shocking. I mean, I think there's, there's now a focus on who the artist is to the exclusion of absolutely anything else. And um, ironically, people are not looking at artworks anymore as artworks, they're looking at them simply as expressions of, um, of individual people, right? And with the assumption, of course, that all people of a certain race or gender or so on are going to think exactly the same way. Um, 
And there's another interesting case, it just makes me think about this, which, which maybe also raises questions about the relationship between the artist and the work of art. I don't know the details, but quite a few years ago, there was a, a novel that was published to rave reviews. And it was written in the first person as, um, I think a young, I think an Indian woman or Iranian woman. Um, uh, and it, it was a novel, but it was, it was written in, in the first person. I think that was the character. It turns out that the writer was actually a white Australian man. And apparently when people found, found this out, they became absolutely furious. Uh, the book, you know, which initially had done very, very well and people were praising it, suddenly got slated. Um, and it's an interesting question about why did it matter? Um, you know, over a hundred years ago, the um, Charlotte Bronte and Emily Bronte had to publish under pseudonyms because people thought, you know, women couldn't write. Are we now again getting to the point where we sort of judge the work in terms of, of the writer and we again can't make that act of interpretation, right? We seem to be failing to make the required acts of interpretation. We seem to sort of think that a work of art is literally like a mirror of the soul um, with nothing in between, you know? And I think that's a terrible way to think about, to think about art because it denies the complexity of what it means to be a human being, um, you know? Yeah, sorry, I'm sounding like I'm preaching a little bit, which I don't mean to do. <laughs> So, so listening to this, especially as a science fiction author myself, mm. um, it, it's, I, I feel, you know, outrage uh, that art is censored, that art is judged purely because of the demographic features of the artist. Um, you know, these are outrageous, outrageous things. Um, and then the, the philosophical, the philosopher in me asks this question. So Mark and I love to discuss the trolley problem. Mm. Um, and there was a lovely trolley problem proposed um, a while ago on the internet. It was a meme. Um, and, and the meme went something like this, right? So imagine, you, you know, trolley problems, the way they work is you've got a track and you've got this train or this trolley on the track and it, it, it's going to hit something on the track, right? So what it's going to hit is it's going to hit a bunch of school children, say, right? So they're, they're tied to the track. And you can pull a lever, you're standing next to the train, you can pull a lever and the train will will move over to a different track, no longer hit the five school children. Um, but instead, what it'll do is it, it, it will plow into a museum with amazing pieces of art, right? You know, the greatest pieces of art we've had. Um, I said they're all lined up there and maybe it'll, it'll tip over, it'll hit an electrical wire and it'll start a fire and everything in the museum will burn down, right? So you spoke earlier about the value of art, okay? And, and Mark asked this question, which is, is that value something that we can weigh up against, say, a fence? And you said, well, no, your, your, your intuition is that art has the kind of value where it shouldn't be censored. So it's kind of, it almost has kind of an absolute value. And the question is, how absolute is that? Like, can you, can you measure it against people's lives? If your answer is, is no, it still has more value than those school children then some people are going to say, okay, wait, I'm not so sure, right? If you say, if you go the other way and you say, well, um, yeah, okay, now we can start making comparisons and maybe art will come off worse in certain circumstances. Suppose it's not five school children, but 500 or 5,000 or 50,000 or, you know, at some point, if you're going to say, no, they trump, then, then what you're saying is that art's value is not absolute, you know, it's not, it's not, it doesn't have this lexographic, uh, um, this like this absolute value, which can't be compared or set off against any other types of values, in which case we could move back from that point, right? So we could say, all right, if art's value is not absolute or perfect, if, if, there's, if there's some limitation to art's value, well, then isn't there a level of offense or a level of hurt or a level of, can we move back to the point where once that, that hurt gets to a certain level, the utilitarian is going to say maybe it outweighs the value of the art. So this is not a position I want to arrive at, right? I, I'm an artist, so I, I don't want to arrive at that position, but I, I just wonder whether there's not a problem there. So the first thing is obviously you can make more kids, but can you paint them for the money? <laughs> <laughs> We're never going to okay, run out Mark, of kids, Jason. Okay, Mark, Mark, not kids. Maybe artists. Artists. No, they've killed artists. 
<laughs> Eliza's a very strict uh, vegetarian, so if you had bunny rabbits Yo, on the track as well. Okay, what about some bunny rabbits on the track? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I was thinking that. I was thinking not only would I probably destroy art for the, for the children, but also probably for the dogs as, and cats as well. <laughs> and, you know, so... Um, I don't think that art is worth more than, um, you know, than, than human lives or even animal lives or animal suffering. Um, so I don't think that art, the value of art or the, trumps everything. Um, in the same way, of course, that, you know, we still want to say, well, human beings' lives are very, very important, but we don't want to say that the life of a single human being trumps everything. Um, so, so yes, I mean, there are going to be times when we are going to, to risk uh, destroying, destroying art um, if you're going to be saving human lives, for example. Um, but I think the bar is still pretty high. You know, how high is it? I do think that is something that we maybe can't decide a priori, but that's okay. Um, because there are going to be lots of other valuable things in life that we're going to want to say, well, I'm not always sure, you know. But... Um, yeah, would I have sacrificed all of the art in the world in order for, you know, for the Holocaust not to have happened? Of course. We would have saved, you know, my family in the Holocaust. Yeah, of course. Um, I thought it got really, but, you know, when I was looking at the meme, I, I thought there might be a certain number of school children that I would be willing <laughs> to sacrifice for all the art in the world. Um, it, it, it wasn't a simple calc for me. Uh, it wasn't as simple as, Every life is infinitely valuable and, 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 and art must go. And on the other hand, it wasn't as simple as, well, the art is infinitely valuable and any number of people could go. Mm-hmm. It seemed like a really hard question. And given that, given that it is a hard question, it does suggest that the value of art is not infinite. Yes, I, I think the value of art is, is not infinite. Um, look, I'm also a bad person to ask about trolley problems because I... Um, I just don't really take them seriously. So, um, uh, so it's difficult for me to kind of think about, about value and ethics in terms of that very strict utilitarian calculus. Uh, if I'm forced to make it, then, then that's where I'm going to lay my cards, you know. Um, but, you know, you'll have to maybe tell me more about who the people are, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> if it's a, a bunch of animal torturers versus uh, all the works of Chagall, it, I might actually have a different have, have a different response. So, but um, I don't. Yeah, I won't commit myself in um, you know to all eternity on the Zoom. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think Jason's um, point is that if it does feel at some point like a tension, not an easy choice, then that does give us an indication that art is pretty damn valuable. And maybe he's right about this notion of lexicographic categories that maybe um, human life is going to trump art, but human offense is not going to trump art, no matter how much human offense there is. Uh, it just doesn't, it's not about adding up points. It's about categories. And we might think that, uh, you know, art can be sacrificed, but under only very rare conditions. Um, I want to think about, you know, we're at this interesting time now um, where, you know, offense levels are, are very high. Um, and you know there are works of art which are being targeted and there are other kinds of aesthetic objects that are being targeted so in the states there's been a, a call for um stained glass windows um to be to be smashed on the grounds that they have um white christs um and that that's a, a sort of a racist depiction um of of jesus um and that that needs to be dismantled i mean this is an interesting thing and in that's you know we had prior times in our history when people got very uncomfortable about uh you know, certain kinds of religious depictions. So there's those calls again. But there's also calls for various historical figures to be um, taken down. So um, uh, it sort of started off with, let's say, um, Civil War generals that fought for the Confederacy. Um, But it has since moved on rather rapidly to um, the American founding fathers on the grounds that um, Washington and Jefferson were slaveholders um, and that their status should be taken down. there's been calls for, let's say, for, for Lincoln um, to be taken down as well. Um, and uh, we, can, we can think about an interesting object that sort of straddles the line between, let's say, uh, a monument and a sculpture and a work of art. Um, if we think about Mount Rushmore, 
it, it has these three figures and Teddy Roosevelt's. Teddy Roosevelt's statue is being, being taken down by Mayor de Blasio in New York, uh, also on the grounds that it's deemed to be offensive. So if the next call then is to say, um, we should blow up Mount Rushmore. Mount Rushmore is uh, enormously offensive because it was built on sacred land. It's in South Dakota. It was um, you know, land held by Native Americans. And uh, you had this sort of imprint of um, the patriarchy, uh, the white patriarchy, particularly on this uh, natural space. We should blow it up. Um, so how do we respond to that? And can we, can we also make sense of certain kinds of sculptures where we think, well, or statues where we think this, there's a good reason to take this down. So, for example, um, you know, when Saddam Hussein um, was taken out of power, people removed, they pulled down statues of Hussein, um, you know, themselves. You had uh, statues of Stalin being blown up um, under Khrushchev, you know, with the recognition that he was a, an evil tyrant. So how do we square our intuitions about art objects and these monuments? As you were talking about uh, the founding fathers in Washington, I actually thought immediately of Mount Rushmore. And I thought, are they going to be destroying that? And then, of course, what we might also want to do is, is get rid of uh, Hitchcock's North by Northwest, because there's that famous scene in, in the movie where the Cary Grant character climbs up Mount Rushmore. And so um, um, I know certainly they, they, uh, Gone with the Wind has been taken off of Netflix, and I think they're going to put it back up again, but with you know, the appropriate uh, contextual features and so on. Um, I mean, I guess the, one of the questions that we can ask is whether statues are themselves works of art. Um, and, you know, if the answer is no, um, because not all sculptures are necessarily works of art. Um, and I think, you know, if, for example, I think at least on maybe Dante's definition, you know, something was simply made to commemorate a certain person, but we don't really think of it as a work of art. Um, um, it might be valuable still, but it's, it'll have a different value from the value um, of, of a work of art. Look, historical context is, is obviously going to be important. You know, if you've just been, say, living through the Second World War and uh, it's now come to an end and you're, you know, um, in Germany, you don't want statues of Hitler all over the place. You know, I could perfectly understand why people want to get, would want, want to get rid of all sort of emblems of, of, Nazi, of Nazi rule. And, there, and that doesn't seem to, be, seem to me to be particularly um, problematic. Um, I also do think that sometimes, the, again, is this conflation between, between the person and the, and the, the statue, um, that there's this kind of, what makes me uncomfortable if there's, there's this kind of historical fervor in getting rid of, of statues, which just makes me feel very uncomfortable because as a philosopher, I just think things should be done for reasons and, uh, and certainly, certainly the current context would allow for that. And I, that just makes me uncomfortable, sort of getting rid of all these statues. Uh, even if we don't think of them as particularly good works of art, that in itself just makes me uncomfortable. And, and I would want to guard against, um, to guard against that. Um, but if, let's say, there is something that is a great, a great work of art, and say a great sculpture of, of somebody um, who we don't particularly like, let's say even of, of uh, maybe, maybe Winston Churchill is a good example. You know, you could make a case that he was a sort of a war criminal, perhaps. Um, I would, I would, my intuition would still be that we don't destroy the work of art. You know, um, you know, if, suppose that there's a, you know, I'm Jewish, so, you know, I, I would, you know, uh, clearly not think that Hitler had any redeeming qualities, right? And suppose there were a sculpture of Hitler that was done by this, by let's say the kind of Michelangelo of, of his day. Uh, would I want to destroy that statue or that sculpture? Um, I would want to say no. You know, it's not the real person. It's a sculpture. Uh, one can learn lots of interesting things by looking at the sculpture. It doesn't mean that you therefore in favor of Nazism. Um, but context might make a difference, right? It depends where that, that sculpture is, is placed and um, do you want to put it in the middle of a town hall in Berlin? Probably not. Um, so I, I do think that those kinds of, of questions about controversial characters, that kind of discussion I think is worth having. I suppose my main worry about the moment is that we're simply not having those kinds of discussions. That's one of my main worries about this current craziness. 
uh, is that there's no dialogue, there's no real intellectual discourse. Um, and my intuition is then to say, well, let's stop doing anything until we can actually have a proper intellectual discussion. I often show when I teach aesthetics, I, um, I do a, a section in my course on ethics and aesthetics, about whether works of art that are, it's a particular question that um, some, some 20th century, 21st century philosophers have raised. It's about whether a work of art that has a morally bad point of view that is racist or sexist in some way, for example, um, or glorifies murder or something, whether that detracts from the aesthetic value of a work of art, which I think is a very interesting question. Um, can a work of art, um, uh, it, so in other words, is an ethical evaluation of the work of art, is the ethical point of view of the work of art, part of its aesthetic appreciation? Um, and I often show my students Triumph of the Will um, as an example of a work of art that is, in its day, it was a great, a great film. It had fantastic, you know, the, uh, Triumph of the Will was this movie made by Leni Riefenstahl um, about, um, uh, it was a very pro-Nazi film. Uh, it really glorified Hitler and um, and depicts the Nuremberg rally and you know um, and in its day won lots of awards and has amazing uh, cinematography and and so on but you know it's a pro-Nazi film. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to argue that we should get rid of Triumph of the Will and I mean I use it in class for example. I show my students Triumph of the Will, I've watched the film, I think it's a very interesting film in all sorts of ways. Um, I clearly don't think it should be banned. Uh, or destroyed or, you know, does the fact that it's a pro-Nazi film detract from its aesthetic value? I think that's actually a much more interesting question. Um, I think, in fact, probably it does. Um, but but I, I think that if we don't have these works of art around, we can't even have these, these discussions. And that, that, I think, is very problematic. I wouldn't want uh, The Merchant of Venice, for example, to be banned. You know, if it's anti-Semitic, I'm not sure it is, but there's a good case that it could be. Uh, the Jew of Malta, I think, is probably a very anti-Semitic play. Would I want it banned? Absolutely not. Um, I think it would be appalling if, if it were banned. Um, so I think we need to be mature about works of art, right? Just because a work of art is anti-Semitic doesn't mean that one can't go and watch it and have interesting discussions about it. But I, I think that there's a kind of hysteria at the moment about all sorts of things, which I think is very, very problematic. Um, you know, do we in future, and you know, speaking as a vegan, do we want to like go back in time and look at all the works of art and all the books ever written and want to say, look, everything that's not written by a vegan or vegetarian, we've got to get rid of? Of course not. That would be crazy. Um, and the same way, you know, yes, people were, were racist, were sexist, owned slaves. It doesn't mean that we have to destroy absolutely everything because humans, humans are basically, um, you know, we're not very nice creatures. Uh, is that you know if we if we're going to start um, looking at absolutely everything through a particular moral lens, we'll we'll have nothing left at the end of the day. You are saying that you know these moral features are relevant, but they shouldn't be overriding, at least mm -hmm. not overriding in all cases. Yeah, and it strikes me that there's this obsession with the kind of purity, as you say, which doesn't have a clear end. So if the idea is that we need to uh, vanquish everything from our history which we find morally distasteful um, it's not clear where that stops as you as you point out you know we have a history of people um, eating meat and you know there are going to be some very uh, good uh, ethical arguments about why that's an atrocity um, and why all of those people did something uh, very vile and to say that well, we then should destroy all of you know anything they ever touched any work of art that they made because uh, you know, any book they wrote because of this, the stain on their soul um, strikes me as very dangerous. And it, it's, you know, this, you know, we sort of talk about things being Orwellian, but this seems like a very good case for it. This idea of a, a permanent erasure of history as we update our mores, we just want to sort of expunge continually. And the problem is that then we then have nothing to learn from. So there's some value in being able to, you know, look at something like Triumph of the World and say, you know, this was a piece of beautiful propaganda and look at the evil ends it was put um, towards, you know, um, 
And maybe we should be aware of current propaganda that does that. Maybe we should try and be critical of it. But if we expunge triumph of the war from our history, we can't do that. You know, we can't sort of see the, you know, the similarities coming up. And a similar thing with, with Mein Kampf, you know, um, that you found that Jewish organizations have said, don't ban it, but, you know, contextualize it, explain what this book did, you know, annotate it, uh, because it's going to be incredibly useful for picking out the fascists that, that, are, that arise, you know, in our generation and in future generations. And you can at least say, you know, we've been here before. If you erase it, you know, you, you can then very easily repeat the sordid history that we've had. I wonder if there's not some kind of intermediate position um, where you don't erase the work um, you know, if you think about um, during apartheid, um, there were certain books that were, you were not allowed to distribute them, um, but they were kept. Um, so one of the examples is Salman Rushdie's um, the, the, the Satanic Verses. Um, it, was, it was kept under lock and key at, in one of the Witz libraries. Um, and, and post-1994, it was released. Um, I, I think that might be a better position for for your opponent to take rather than erase it to kind of keep it for posterity. So that that, that would satisfy your requirements of having it available to look up and learn from, you know, in terms of its its value, not the satanic verses, but let's say, uh, let's say something genuinely offensive. I, I really like Salman Rushdie's work, but- How but dare say- you imply the satanic verses are <laughs> not offensive, Jason? I find that deeply wounding. <laughs> you need to apologize now. <laughs> but the point is you could, you could keep it, right? But hide it. That would be a, 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 a there would be a middle ground. I'm still not going to be satisfied with it personally, but it would answer your objection, Mark. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting, interesting view. I mean, uh, as you say, we've sort of done this kind of thing before. We try and quarantine works of art. And that's what UCT is doing, is that from what I understand, I think there's 77 works of art that are prisoners. Um, and, and maybe the, the, the advantage of that is that you have a martyrdom as well. So, you know, those that are sort of willing to be a bit brave can point out the, the political prisoners that are, that are kept in UCT's basement and say, you know, this we find troubling. At least you haven't destroyed them. I mean, there are works of art that were destroyed uh, at UCT. There were, um, you know, paintings pulled off of residence walls and set alight. Um, so, you know, you might think it's a one-up. At least you can eventually re- release the political prisoner. Um, but I do think it reflects very badly on a society that, that takes that view. And, and Eliza points out the strange thing of treating these objects like people. So if we think about that statue of Colston, who was a slave trader, you know, when the statue was pulled down, he was paraded, the statue was paraded through the streets as if it were a person. It, it went through a kind of Game of Thrones shame-like rally until it was, you know, tied up, splattered in paint, and then dumped in a river. And it's sort of treated as the scapegoat. Um, and there's something, this kind of fervor, this anger, this animalism that seems uh, dangerous um, and that there's a lot to be said for saying, can we just pause and have a conversation before we do this? Just for the record, I don't hold this position. I don't <laughs> want to hold this position. <laughs> the philosopher in me is desperately trying to find an objection here, really struggling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I must say that there is also something of the, the kind of religious pure, uh, puritanism in this, in this new movement. Uh, this obsession with purity as well, with um, not having any sin, uh, strikes me as being deeply, deeply worrisome, actually, um, and a sort of denial of the of the complexities of you know of human life. Excellent. Well, Eliza, I want to say thank you very much for a phenomenal conversation. I think we managed to uh, traverse a lot of interesting ground, um, and uh, you know, I, I think coming to grips with what art is um, and its value and then working out why it's worth saving, um, you know, is, is an important topic. I'd sort of had this, this episode in mind for, for a long time and thought of it as a rather abstract episode. Um, and it's become one that's, be, you know, vitally important. Um, I think we're now at a sort of time in our history when, you know, art and aesthetic objects are under grievous assault and it's, uh, it's worth sticking our necks over the parapet to defend them. Thanks very much for, for inviting me on. And, and I think it is true. I think, um, you know, sort of at the moment saying that you want a particular work of art to be um, widely read or to be available uh, amounts to uh, an act of heresy in, in some quarters, which is a very, very strange position, you know, um, to be in. So 
in some ways it, it kind of puts art at the at the forefront and i think we need um defenders of art you know to in a sense speak on on behalf of art uh, and the artist otherwise everything is going to be seen as part of ideology or part of politics and and i personally think that that would be i think that that would lead to the death of art actually i think art needs to be independent uh, artists need to be independently minded one thing I must say, which is that, you know, I might be speaking so strongly about art because um, we integrated into the show. So um, some astute viewers will notice that um, in every episode, I have a different work of art over my shoulder. Um, and a lot of it is made by a young South African artist. This particular piece, some of you will recognize from an episode we did um, on whether you live in a simulation. It's made by Joanne Ivy. Um, and uh, a lot of our thumbnails are also made by South African artists. So it's something that we, we treasure on the show. Thank <laughs> you.